Okay, back, uh, sorry about that guys, uh, I had a bit of a technical issue. Okay, so today I've got my chai tea ready and uh, ready to get into it. Um, we're talking about Class D operations and uh, Class D can be a little bit confusing and uh, I'll show you why in, in a minute. Um, if uh, We'll start that sis and we'll get that cranking and uh, I'll, show, I'll explain maybe better why Class D can be a little bit confusing. All right, so you can see I've opened up this before. So let's say, for example, you've operated, I don't know, Melbourne approach and you want to do some Class D uh, airports. So the first thing you've got to do is you go to position and you see up the top here Metro D and then you've got procedural tower. Now they're both classified as Class D, um, but um, with the metro towers, you can see here up the top, you've got the Archerfield, Bankstown, Camden, Jandigot, Moorabbin, blah, blah, blah. Those, back in the day, were, taught, were called gap airports. And what that was meant is general aviation. And that basically is uh, what they were. They were specifically used for general aviation and predominantly they're used for training. And uh, as you can see, each state there has its own particular, you know, uh, training airport, i.e. Moorabbin in, in Victoria, you've got Jandicott over here in WA, you've got Bankstown up in um, New South Wales, you've got Parafield over in um, South Australia, you've got Archerfield up in Queensland. So they're really basically um, your general training areas and they predominantly operate in under VMC conditions. So you see that, you know, they all sort of, when, when, when you've got IMC conditions, you don't see a hell of a lot of activity because basically it's just kit blokes at people that just started out their flight training. Now, Class D operations also involves these guys here, which is procedural towers. And as you can see the list, you know, it goes from Alice Springs, Broome up here in WA. And they used, as the name implies, all procedural standards to, um, yeah, they use all procedural standards to separate incoming inbound and outbound aircraft, whereas basically, uh, I, using, I keep saying basically and I'll try to stop that, whereas the metros, they really just use the visual means to separate aircraft. And we'll go through that later on. And today I really want to on, operate on, or concentrate on the metro towers and all these general aviation towers. So um, now when you, when you want to start off, you, you have a look here, you, you can pick Camden, you know, so today we'll, we'll, we'll use uh, Moorabbin as an example. And um, now the first thing is to look at, okay, you can see Moorabbin um, and you see the general map and you can see the Victorian coastline here, there's the coastline and you see all these GMH, car, shoal, and I'll explain that. But if you want to operate, or you want to see what's on the ground, of course, because you as a tower controller, you're going to be operating aircraft on the ground. So this, obviously, this chart or this uh, visual aid doesn't help you. You want to see actual, um, you want to see aircraft on the ground when they take. So you can actually, you see Class D up here, and you go to Rabin, um, Metro Class D, and you see it there, and you can, I like the position in the free with the text. So I've got two screens, but if you only got one screen, that's probably the best way to position it, but I've got two screens, I'm afforded the luxury of all. So I basically have this screen open, and then I've got the ground screen, let's call it the ground screen, on, the, on another screen. So that gives me an overall view. So why do we... What, what does all this, all this mean? Well, understand what these symbols and this line mean. You need to operate or you need to get hold of, and which in Australia we can do, re we can do recently in the last year or so, been available um, 
or uh, Air Service Australia has enabled uh, people to download uh, what they call visual terminal charts. And what you need to do, uh, you need to go to uh, Air Services Australia or AIP and that's the, so if you have a look at that, that's, so you go down, you scroll down, you press I agree and you've got the AIP charts and you've got the visual terminal charts and these gives you all the terminal charts. So you want the Melbourne area, Melbourne VTC and that will line up, that will load up I should say. Now actually I like to download it because the PDF um, is a lot easier to navigate with. So let's just close that, let's just bring the PDF document over here. Okay, so we have this lovely chart. Now if we zoom in, I, I left, I can hold down the control key and use a mouse, you can see um, these symbols are kind of a little bit overbearing, but if you have a look at um, at this, you can see the Moravian control zone is basically from surface to 2500 and you see the D here, so that's a class D, that's why it's called a class D and it's called me Metro. Um, and Basically, tower has control from surface up to two and a half thousand, and so all that area there, you need a clearance to enter that airspace. That's what it basically means, and the tower looks after you from that point. Um, now, like I said, you see these symbols here, and as you see that brighten, and you've got if you can, if I just See how you've got this underscore, you've got the B and the T and the O and you've got this diamond symbol and well that means it's a VFR reporting point. And well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a look at this, BTO. So that's what BTO is, it's the Brighton Jetty. If you have a look at here, CERB, well that's, that's CERB, see the underscore there, that's Cerebrus which is, I think it's an, a shipwreck or something. I don't live in Melbourne. So you can see that these diamond shapes, now you see the difference between that, the solid square and that. Well, that Cerebrus is a tracking point. So if you're coming over from the east, uh, west I should say, and see this, these dotted lines, that is very similar to what VATSIS is showing you. And it's basically, see this line here, that's the visual tracking points or the visual VFR route, what they call the VFR route. So if you're coming from, uh, and what this does basically, it tries to keep you under the Class Charlie airspace, so you don't have to talk, because the minute you enter Class Charlie, or before you enter Class Charlie, you have to talk to Melbourne Approach, or Departures, whoever. So as a VFR aircraft, in the real world, you're busy enough looking out for other aircraft, because that's what VFR is all about. You're looking after yourself. You haven't got some guy sitting in a tower or sitting in some dark room with a radar looking after you. you you're out. You're on your own, basically. So you, you're busy looking out the window, A, navigating, and B, looking for any aircraft. So it's a hell of a job just to do that. And the last thing you want to do is start talking to some Melbourne approach because the more tasks you've got, the more, more likely chance you've got of stuffing up. So if you're busy trying to tune in a radio in the real world and you're there looking at your radio and not noticing this guy on your left-hand side, same level, coming straight towards you because he's doing probably the same thing. So VFR, air, VFR flying is, is fairly taxing and if you see some videos on that, you see the guy always constantly looking, 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 looking because that's what it's all about. It's always looking out the window. So that's the VFR route, and you can see also there's another one up here. Uh, they call it, yeah, see how it says up here, the recommended VFR route. So if you fly out of Moorabbin, um, oh, by the way, that's another thing. These basically are normally set, these VFR reporting points are normally set for incoming aircraft or inbound aircraft. So whether it's, for example, uh, if you're coming in from the west, you see here, Cardinia Reserve, reservoir 
and uh, you'll see that on VATSIS. Um, let's see if we can see it. C-A-R, I think E it was. C-A-R-E. See, if you can see the very... I'll, I'll zoom in there. See how there's an underscore? C-A-R-E. So if you go back to VATSIS. Now, uh, C-A-R-E. And GMA. Now, if you want to operate as a um, operate Moorabbin Tower, you have to know these off by heart. And that's some of the things that probably people aren't aware of because you have to know exactly. Because in the real world, uh, the aircraft reports inbound and I'll go through the radio call that the aircraft needs to make on the inbound calls. What you'll do, is, what you'll see is when this guy in the tower, in the real world, he'll straight away, he'll look out to whatever direction. So if, if this guy sitting in town, somebody reports a GMH, uh, he knows exactly which direction. And he'll, if he can't see him, he'll get him binoculars. You see the guy up in the town, they get the binoculars. Because they need to identify that aircraft. Because what that guy is saying is, look, I'm over to the east or I'm at, you know, Cerebrus or Brighton. You know, can you see me? Because... The air traffic controller needs to see him in order to, to separate him from other aircraft. He needs to visually acquire that aircraft because at the end of the day, if I can't see you, well, how can I control you? Because obviously uh, there are joining instructions when the person reports, and we'll go through that. We'll, um, we'll go through that, uh, um, how we, um, all the necessary radio calls that we need to make. So... Um, yeah, so it, it's important if you log on to... Just don't log on here and just sort of think, oh, yeah, I'll start operating or I'll start... Because, A, you need to you need to memorise certain things. You need to memorise that this, you know, BRO means Brighton. So BTO, I should say, means Brighton. Um, and you need to understand what all these symbols are. And I know it's a bit taxing, but you have to actually remember all these symbols. Um, now, because with Flight Simulator 2020, and I'm not sure if these all these VFR reporting points are prevalent, I know for a fact that Brighton Jetty is, is there. It shows up. Not sure if Cerebrus. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, if you're operating X-Plane or P3D, well, good luck. However, there is a way around that. With, if you're using P3D, I'm not sure X-Plane. There is a way of around that, and we'll talk about that um, and it's to do with your GPS. You can actually put these things into your GPS. Um, and I highly recommend, if you're flight planning VFR, I highly recommend using Little Nav Map because I'm sure Little Nav Map will have these VFR reporting points. And if they don't, uh, I'm sure there's a way of, of putting them in. There must be a way of putting them in. So you can basically, if you're using X-Plane or P3D, you put these into, you upload your your little nav map plan into your GPS and then, you know, pretend and the GPS will tell you when you're, you're, you're near Brighton Jetty or Cerebrus and you, and you can use it that way even though you haven't visually seen it whereas in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 you'll probably actually see it. So this is the beauty of Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's, it's geared towards, a lot more geared towards VFR flying but in time it'll, it'll come with for IFR as well, it just needs... Hi, Jack, how are you, mate? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm using the VTC, yep, for the Melbourne area. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, I'm just going through the Class D stuff and what we what you need to know if you want to operate. Um, and uh, like I said, you have to know all what these symbols mean because I can bet you in the real world they know exactly what... Brighton Jetty is and which way it is and which way to look. But we've, we're going to use, we, you know, we use this radar screen or this screen as a, a visual aid, let's say. We're pretending we're in the tower. Okay, so now that's from an ATC perspective. Now, what is Moorabbin all about? And um, You're good. Uh, Sorry, what do you mean you're good, Jack? I'm not quite with you. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, yeah, as in how you feeling? Yeah, yeah, good. No, I'm good too, mate. I've got me, um, I've got me chai tea with me, so I'm on top of the world. 
Okay, so um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a bit of a rundown. Um, I'm going to talk about the Moorabbin control. Well, there's not really much to talk about Moorabbin control zone. Um, now, Moorabbin is, um, if we go to, I want to show you this. There's something, you as a pilot, let's say, for example, you want to do a bit of a flight and you want to, I don't know, leave Moorabbin and go to wherever you want to go. It doesn't really matter. There's something that you really must be familiar with, and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, if you go to Air Services, um, or AIP package, Air Services, and once again, you come down here and you press I agree, you need to go to the en route SUP down here and... En route SUP, you get all this stuff. And you see all these aerodromes, FACs, and you have a look. Well, you need to be familiar because even though a lot of procedures in Class D are very similar as in, you know, uh, their reporting and what they say to the air traffic controllers, but you as a pilot, every aircraft, every um, aerodrome, and I know they're all Class Class D, uh, or Metro Class D, have different procedures and you need to be familiar from a pilot point of view. And how do you know what those procedures are? Well, let's, let's have a look. And also, you've got to understand the airport where you're flying from and also too. But let's just take, say, for example, we're a pilot and we want to go from Maram to wherever. OK, now I'm not sure what... I should know what FAC means, but anyhow, let's... I don't know what FAC means. I could make a stab at it. And we get this. It's important, and there's a lot of information in its FAC. However, there's information here that we sort of... We don't necessarily... We can filter out. Um, hello, hi, Jason. There's a premiere video. Yeah, no, this is it. It's... Uh, I've got into the hang of uh, streaming now, so I'm quite liking it, actually. It's better than actually doing a video, recording it, trying to upload it to YouTube. This goes straight on there. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so hopefully you'll enjoy the journey and uh, we'll see, hopefully you can learn something from it. So there's a lot of stuff to really, uh, you can read in your own time, but there's sort of like anything else. You've got to pick the good bits out of it. Now, obviously, you can have a look at the... Um, the uh, the airport diagram that's obviously very helpful, and you can you, there's other places where you can download this. Um, but there, I'll I'll try to illustrate the point or the things you should be looking for. Now you're not really worried about handling service and facilities. This tells you all about how to you know buy have gas and whatever, and if fuel is available 24/7, blah blah blah. And talks about taxiways and you know 15 metre wingspan applies for the aerodrome, blah blah blah, and all the the metas. And now, obviously, um, by the way, uh, if you want to know what the, you can actually ring this number on your phone, and it'll actually give you the aeronautical or the weather information. And if you're departing Morabin, you want to know a if it's. Yeah, hi, Jason. Yeah, well, the see, procedural towers is a is something I don't really know a lot about. And what we're talking about procedural, and what as I said at the beginning of the stream, procedural towers are things to do, or towers like Broome, Albury, Alice Springs, they're like procedural towers. And hopefully, I'll, I'll find the information that probably. But um, today, I'm going to be just talking about the metros. Uh, and, you know, what they... They used to be called gap airports back in the day, and it was just basically general aviation. So, yeah, procedural towers, yeah, phraseology, but they use... Uh, yeah, they use different standards, and I'm not 100% sure uh, with that, but I probably will find out. I mean, you know, I've got bugger all else to do in my time, um, apart from playing poker, but we'll not talk about that. So, yeah, so you can pick the bits of information that are really applicable, A, to you as a pilot. So there's your AWIS, freq AWIS frequency, 120.9, available outside tower hours, blah, blah, blah. So, or you can ring them up actually on the phone. If you ring that number, you'll actually hear a recording 
of what the so anyhow so we're not really interested in physical characteristics whether it's you know I don't know all this rubbish and the aerodrome lighting and medium intensity runway lights yeah okay big deal blah 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 however this becomes important now we'll talk about why why have they said here Melbourne Centre one three five decimal seven well we'll talk about that later on but you got here tower Merriam Tower one one eight decimal one and one two three and you can see here one two three decimal zero well why have we got two frequencies well and I know when you log on as a Moorabbin Tower, I think uh, if you go to VTC, I think it only gives you one frequency, I think. I'm not sure. I think it's only, let's have a look. Connect. Uh, let's have a look. Connect. Oh, maybe someone's on it. I bet you someone's on it. Could not connect to AFE, disconnect and... Uh, Oh, call sign. Someone's on it. Okay, let's have a look. Some smart ass. Doesn't matter. Daniel. Okay, Daniel's on Moorabbin. Okay, Daniel. All right, so I can't connect, but I'm sure it's 118 decimal 1 if I was to connect to Moorabbin. But as we saw, uh, there's two frequencies here. So in the real world, You've got 118 decimal 1 and you've got um, 123 decimal 0. So 123 decimal 0 is for operations out in the west. So let's say, for example, you're coming in from, I don't know, any airfield west of Moorabbin and you're coming in, you've got to contact this number, 123 decimal 0. Now, VATSIM, of course, I think they just use the one frequency and it makes sense. I mean, why would you have two... But in the real world, because Moorabbin gets quite busy, so 118 is decimal one is used for traffic uh, east of the field. Uh, let's say, for example, you're coming in from Laverton, which is to the east. This is the tower frequency you should be on. So that's something in the real world that you should be familiar, and you should be familiar with all these frequencies. And I'll talk, like I said, I'll talk about why, why they included centre here, Melbourne Centre. Talk about that later on. Okay, so, and also this is important in the real world, of course, is these, this is the towers of operations. Now, once this, outside of these hours, so from 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night between Monday and Friday, Moorabbin Tower is, is, is live, is, is online, um, is operational, I should say. That would be a better word. After that, what happens to Moorabbin Tower? Well, after that, it goes Class G. Okay, and that has a, that has ramifications. Okay, and you can see here, Moorabbin Tower provides ATC ATS air traffic services within the class D aircraft surface to two and a half thousand, which is of course, and as we saw on the chart, uh, that's the control zone. Now, after tower hours, it comes class G, and now it becomes a CTAF. So in in the real world, that's what happens. In the VATSIM world, of course, there, there is no... Like at the moment, you've got Daniel operating, but once Daniel shuts down, it becomes a CTAP. So if you're a pilot, for God's sake, and you see Melbourne approaches on and you're a VFR aircraft, don't call him. He doesn't want to know you because you're a VFR aircraft. You're looking out for yourself. Okay? So that's something you as a pilot need to understand fully, is that if there's no... Moorabbin Tower, and you're a VFR aircraft, you suddenly become, it's CTAF procedures. And I'll talk about that probably in another stream somewhere. And because um, CTAF procedures, because I've, I've seen videos of people making all sorts of weird and wonderful calls. You know, uh, here's um, Alpha Bravo Tango, upwind, turning left, going to my grandma's funeral, uh, navigating the 260 radial, estimating that. I'm thinking, well, what the hell? What are you talking about? You know, it's like you don't tell me your life story. You just there are just specific, short, snart, sharp, snappy uh, radio calls that you need to make. There are some obligatory calls you need to make in the CTAP, and then there are if there's traffic around, then there are other calls you make, and that's probably the subject of another video. 
Okay, so that's that's important. So that's sort of info, inf information that you as a pilot need to absorb. Okay, and then now also, you notice know see a local traffic regulator, which is really important. And you can say there's a thing called a start approval. Now, any time you want to do operations, you need to do you need what they call a start approval. It's very similar to what they when the jets call you up as an air traffic controller, push and start. Yeah, clearance, you know, and you say, yeah, push approved, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very similar. And now, you can see here, aircraft departing for AWK means area work in the Melbourne TMA. Basically, what that, as I said earlier, this is, um, this is because it's a training area, these guys go out to the, out to the east or west and they protect, they, you know, because you're learning how to fly, they practice their steep, turns, their stalls, their, all sorts of procedures. And so they need to advise uh, of their be to get a start clearance uh, because they're going to be going out into the Melbourne TMA. And this is all part of the Melbourne TMA, this class Charlie. Now, you could see out here there's restricted, but that's Point Cook. And that's they do their own thing at Point Cook. You can see it's a CTAF frequency, 126.2. So, and these are all danger areas. And I'll go... That, that's another sort of subject at all. But basically, where you see the restricted areas are basically... Uh, basic, stop saying basically. The restricted areas are normally um, for training areas. So, and um, you see down here, it's, that's sort of a training area. They can do, do their training and they have a certain amount of airspace. So you see surface to 9,000. They can practice all sorts of procedures. So... Yeah, so um, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, okay. So that's what that's what um, that's what the start clearances or start approval, and also aircraft departing above two thousand feet for landing at Essendon. So they need to start approval. So it's really you as a pilot need to absorb all this information because heaven forbid I've. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've, I've heard some funny, I've heard some weird and wonderful, and they're on the radio. They also need to say, um, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie upwind departing the circuit uh, to the west, and that's it, or crosswind departing the circuit uh, to the west. And that's all they need to say, but they don't have to tell me their life story. And, and you know, I've heard it on the, and I've seen videos, and... Um, of a certain person making CTAF uh, calls, and I won't name names. Also, I can say that he plays the... Well, you know, so that's a bit of a clue. He's making weird, you know, lengthy CTAF calls when you don't have to do that. Um, so... Oh, that chai tea is beautiful. So, and now, now, instrument approach and circuit training. Well... Um, as I said before, uh, when you've got VMC conditions, or predominantly Class D is, is operates under VMC conditions, visu visual meteorological conditions, and you can Google that. I won't go into that, but you have to have certain conditions to operate in the area. However, of course, that doesn't stop people coming in uh, doing their instrument approaches, um, and so you need to understand and need to know all that and you can have a look at this I mean not that this happened circuit oh shit what happened here okay I must have <laughs> sorry about that so now if you're practicing circuits now this is handy there's a thousand foot Q&H uh, you've got to report downwind so these are things you've got to incorporate even if you're operating under in the VATSIM ar uh, arrangement. So also, know your circuit directions. So if you're on runway 04, you're on um, HJ. HJ, right, okay. I thought, geez, I had a bit of a brain fart there. HJ means hours of no day, during daylight hours, and H not N means nighttime hours. So during the night, you can't do runway zero four. You you can't operate um, 
they're not available. So you can see here, runway, for example, runway 17 left during night and day, left-hand circuits. Runway 17 right during the day, right-hand circuit, night, not available. Okay? So that's important. So if you want to simulate in, this, in, the, in your under the under your VAT sim, yeah, uh, yeah, Jay, departing Sydney King says, yeah, I know. I, it's, you know, I used to have a low, low level of tolerance, but now I just have a, yeah, bacon, eggs, Rebecca, <laughs> departing for Brisbane. Yeah, I know, yeah. Cessna 142, single engine, had bacon, eggs, for Brecky, age 53, departing for Brisbane. Yeah. No, it's weird and wonderful. So, and this is also important. So you can pick the bones out of this, this document here if you want to use your VATSIM for training and, and simulate. And I've always said, if you have a look at my old videos, I've always said, and um, that simming is, you can make it as real or as unrealistic as as you can. Like, for example, you can just get into your aircraft at Moorabbin and just put in your flight plan onto your bloody GPS thing and go from here, from Moorabbin straight to Laverton or straight to Melbourne and just do it in a straight line. Oh, that's wonderful. But what do you get out of that? Oh, geez, I can fly via my GPS. Well, yeah, whoop de doo Me, I like to do things to more for a realistic a the challenge is there and b that's what that what that's what seeming for me is all about trying to emulate real world procedures. But if you're the type just wants to you know go from a to b and I'll I'll, I'll press my nav, I'll press uh, you know nav on my GPS or whatever and it'll just follow that lovely purple line straight the way through. Well yeah, that's good. Whatever whatever floats your boat so to speak. So. Okay, so we can see here clearance procedures, VFR flights by day, clearance in class G not available from Moorabbin Tower, contact centre. Now remember, as I said before, that's why we have these, the, um, the frequencies. There it is. That's why they give you this frequency. Melbourne Centre, 135.7, because... Uh, if you're, if you're a VFR flight by day and you want to get into Class C, contact Melbourne Center in Class G airspace for clearance. So you need to contact Melbourne Center in Class G airspace for clearance. So that's what that uh, frequency is all about. And so I won't, I won't laboriously go through all this, but in your own time, when you download this document, you basically need to be completely familiar. And not only that, you need to internalise all these procedures. And I know it can be overwhelming, but hey, who said flying was bloody easy? You know? So... So if you're departing IFR into the Melbourne TMA, would you make a departure report? Well, anybody out there can answer that? Anybody? Because don't forget what departure report's all about. Okay. Well, first of all, if you're an IFR, IFR aircraft, uh, if you're going into the Melbourne TMA, you need a clearance, okay? So that's the first thing you do. Um, you need to... So uh, actually, it tells you here operate. I know this is VMC, but you, you, some people don't forget. Even though it's predominantly um, VFR flying, it doesn't preclude you from operating IFR procedures or IFR operations. So um, oh, 
sorry. Um, yeah, so you need to get a clearance, and uh, that's what. That's the first thing you do. Now, if you're departing and you need to be identified, and how you be identified is you make a departure report. So yes, you are. You, you need if you're departing IFR into Melbourne TMA, you need to make a departure report. Okay, so yes, you do, Jack, to answer your question. Okay, so let's say okay, so all the rest of the you don't really. You can see now outside tower hours. Now because when you leave, let's go back to the. When you leave, let's say for example you've taken off and you go two thousand five hundred. See you've got class Charlie sits above this, and as that. As that says, class C airspace above two and a two and a half thousand remains active. Okay, so. So um, yes, you have to be be aware of that. That we're actually um, when what airspace you're going to be flying into at all times, and what do I need to do? That's something you, as a pilot, always have to be aware of. Um, now let's go back to. Uh, I'll try to. Okay, so we looked at. Um, let me just get my thoughts together. Uh, we don't need that. And we don't need that. Okay. So let's say, uh, now, obviously, provision of separation. You as Marab and Tower, what sort of separation do you use? Well, that's pretty, pretty, pretty obvious. You use your eyes. But because we're not sitting in the tower, this is what we use. And we can see, you know, we see a radar... Well, we see a blip over here and we see another guy there and we use this as our, basically, our means of separating the aircraft. But we do it in a way that it's, we don't have the, uh, we don't use radar separation because even though these guys in the real world have a, a little radar screen, they use, use it for situational awareness. And they can see that Alpha Bravo Charlie is out to the west, even though, but they have to still look out the window and look at it. Whereas we can see, oh, Alpha Bravo Charlie's there, and Whiskey Foxtrot Tango's up, up here at, at, at Academy. So we can then use our eyes and tell this aircraft about this aircraft. If we're using runway 17, you know, he could, we could sequence this guy and he'll be number one and tell this guy to be number two to Alpha Bravo Charlie. And, you know, but I'll go through that anyhow, the radio procedures. Okay. Now, um, what are the pilot responsibilities? And this is something that a lot of, a lot of people aren't 100% aware of. Or, so if you're operating in the Melbourne, the Moorabbin control zone, which is this little light grey area, you basically must sight and maintain separation from other aircraft. And air traffic control will tell you always about other aircraft, but it's up to you to, to separate yourself from that aircraft. Air traffic control won't do it, okay? They will give you instructions and they will say, you know, uh, Cessna 172, five mile final, you're number two to that aircraft. But that's what they'll give you. They basically, they're all about the traffic, air traffic control, all about giving you traffic information. They don't actually use the radar, even though there is one there, but they don't sit, they stand up and they're constantly looking outside the tower. So that, you, the separation is all about, is on the, on the, um, the, the pilot. So, okay. So that's the pilot responsibilities. Now, what are the air traffic re responsibility? What are you as an air traffic controller? Well, the first thing is you've got to run, maintain runway separations. And remember back when you did your tower thing, there were certain separations, and I'll be quite honest with you, I've forgotten myself, because I don't do a lot of towers, so it's like anything else. You don't use it, you lose it. So there are certain op uh, runway standards or separation standards, i.e. if the aircraft, I think it's 5,400 kilos, if the leading aircraft is following is 500, 5,400 kilos, you can use, I don't know, 2,400 
metre separation, but basically using runway separation standard. That's the first thing. So you're really con controlling and you, you're basically saying, well, if this guy's landed on the runway, you know that you can have another guy land on that same runway. There is a facility or there is a standard that allows you to do that. But certain conditions must be met and you've got to be fully aware of that. So that's something you need to brush up on because you, if you're controlling Morab and Tower, you need to know that, um, you know, what is that separation standard, runway separation standard. That's your first responsibility. The second responsibility, you've got to issue instructions for and or traffic information, basically, to regulate the traffic. So, like I said before, you've got to tell the guy, there's, um, you know, Cessna 172, 1,400 on left base, you know, and you're number two to that aircraft. Or if you as a pilot can't see that air, you've got to tell the, the guy, hey, I can't see him. Or traffic unsighted. Uh, words to that effect because he's telling you this is where the traffic is but it's up to you to see him and to separate that's basically what what the whole gist of the thing is so yeah so I so it's basically provide the responsibilities to provide uh, relevant traffic information to regulate traffic um, and also the other responsibility is maintain surveillance of aircraft uh, activity within the control zone uh, and, and on the aerodrome. And uh, because you provide top-down, uh, you're also acting as a Moorabbin ground. So you've got to actually ab control the traffic that's taxing. and uh, So that's, that's also your responsibility as well. So that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's the other thing. That's... Um, now... Um, now, clearances. Now, this is what we were talking about before I go on. Let's got to check my. Okay, so as I said before, I may have mentioned it. Um, if the tower is active, you as a you have to obtain a clearance to uh, before you ap operate within this control zone. So that's the first thing you as a pilot. Um, now, obviously, if you if you also there's something I think a lot of pilots aren't as remember as we said we looked at that FAC and each runway has a certain circuit direction. But if you want to go, con you don't necessarily have to go in that circuit direction. Let's say, for example, runway one seven. Uh, that'll be one seven there, and they say there's right hand circuits one seven left and one seven right. I'm not. I can't remember, but let's say, uh, but you want to turn left and you want to go out to Latrobe Valley, which is out to the east. You can, you can still depart, but you've actually got to tell and you've got to get a clearance from air traffic control. So when he looks at you, you say, oh, this guy's, instead of saying, um, well, if he gives you a clearance to take off from 17, let's say, for example, 17 is uh, right hand circuits, let's say, right hand circuits, you're doing this. And you want to go left, he'll say, Alpha Bravo Charlie, Cliff take off, make left turn. So he will he will give you that clearance to go to make that left turn out to Latro Valley. Because otherwise, you're gonna go, let's say you take off, and let's say it's right hand circuits, you're gonna take off, and you'll always depart on a, on the leg of the circuit. So you're gonna be taking off, you do a right hand turn, you go crosswind, or Crosswind, you go upwind, downwind, oh, sorry, oh God. Base, and then you depart the base and you go out to Latrobe Valley. So that's the way you you go out to Latrobe Valley. But you don't want to be spending all that time. You want to just take off and go left turn. Okay? So you need a clearance. You need to you need to tell the guy. Um, so that's something else. Um, now obviously the circuit altitude in uh, You've got to know the circuit altitude. If you're practicing the um, circuits at Moravian, it's a thousand feet. You've got to know that. Um, now, if your Moravian tower is active uh, and you hear it in the real world, you're always there is a requirement to report downwind with your intentions. 
So you say, you know, Rabbit Tower from Rava Charlie down with four. Now, either you're going to do one or two things. You're either going to do a stop and go or you're going to do a full stop or touch and go, I should say. Full stop. <laughs> uh, so it's either, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie downwind for full stop or Alpha Bravo Charlie downwind touch and go. So that air traffic controller, because if you're doing circuits, you're going to be going up, you know, touch and go and up and down, around, around, around. around. Or you say, well, for the full stop. So that's something you need to um, you need to to tell the uh, tell the um, the tower controller. Now, obviously, if you're operating in a CTAF, well, that's something you've got to uh, advise as well. Okay. Um, now, let's say, for example, if you're a pilot. And you're coming in for a trove balance, you don't want to really, you don't not gonna land, but you're gonna transit that control zone. Um, let's say for example, you've planned at you know one thousand or two thousand feet and you want to travel and you want to go transit. Well obviously if tower is active, you need to tell them because you're going to be going into their control zone. And you, you, the last thing he wants is some guy to just go straight through his air. So it makes sense. I mean, really, I mean, what else would you do? Of course, of course you've got to tell the tower. Um, so if you if you want to transit the, and you, because you want to have a look at along the coast, you want to fly, you don't want to be, a, you know, 5,000 feet and then say, oh, you know, I wouldn't mind having a look at Brighton Jetty and, you know, have a bit of a perv along there. I don't know, whatever. Um, and suddenly for go because you can for overfly this at 2,500 but then of course there's this problem here you're going to be in class Charlie so let's say for example you want to stay under the class Charlie um, and 1,500 but that means you're going to transit this control zone you see you're coming over from the east and you want to go straight through 1,500 which you can do but you need to obviously get Control now. Once again, if you're coming from the east, you know, it's a one one eight decimal one. I think it was. If you're coming from the west, it's one two three decimal zero. So it depends. But online, of course, it's just one frequency. So that's something else. Okay. Now let's talk about arrivals from an ATC and from a um, from a from a piloting point of view. Okay. Um, when you're arriving into Moorabbin, there's only one way you can... Well, not one way. There's... As I mentioned previously, these blue diamonds, they're basically VFR reporting points. They're arrival points. So, in other words, if you're coming from... Yeah, have a look at the Cadinia Reservoir... Uh, You've got to go to that point there and then you've got to, once you reach that point or before reaching that point, you've got to say something. And once you get to Academy, so, or, you know, for example, there's GMH, which is obviously the General Motors. That sticks out like a sore thumb. So you've got to report at these reporting points. And there's a specific um, way of, of, or ATC phraseology. So, and you can see out here, if you're coming from the west, there's Brighton, you've got to follow that VFR route, and then Hill, and then uh, Air Traffic Control will give you specific instructions. So, you can see that there's all these VFR reporting points that you have to abide by. You know, if you're coming from the south, you report at Carrum. Not exactly sure what Carrum is, uh, if somebody could enlighten me, but not being from Melbourne, I know everything about Janticott or the reporting points of Janicott, because, you know, I know what they look like, but I'm not sure what Caram is. Is, a, is it a... Well, I don't think it's a jetty. Is it a... Maybe it's, I don't know. I don't, shopping centre? I don't know. I know GMH is obviously GMH, the General Motors Holding. I know Academy is basically the uh, police academy, I think, um, and obviously the reservoir. It's a reservoir. It can't be too hard. So, yeah, and then, of course, if you want to... Coming from the north, you go along what they call this VFR route. So you're at Kilmore, but you don't call Tower at Kilmore. 
say bloody, you just fly along this via this Kilmoyne, you fly along this VFR route to Yan Yan Reservoir, and then from there you track into whatever that is, however you say that, Warrandyte. But normally, and you follow this VFR route, and you normally report. So it keeps you basically out of the Melbourne area. And, and like I said, if you're 1,500, which you can fly, I guess, um, you, can, you can stay under, underneath the Class Charlie airspace. So you could be at 2,500 here, you see. So from Kilmore, if you start your flight and you descend and you're 2,500, you can fly all along here at 2,500, never having to talk to ATC, which is fantastic. And then you just got to be careful before you get into this, air, this airspace, maybe go down to 1,500, uh, Sugarloaf Reservoir, and then from there track down towards Academy at 1,500 because you want to stay under this Class Charlie airspace. Okay, so after that, so what do you say um, as a... Uh, just two seconds, just sorry, sorry about this. Uh, just let me... Okay, so, sorry about that. Okay, let me just check my chat. I don't know if I'm still with you or not. Am I still with you guys? Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. Karim's just a town, is it? Oh, well, there you go. So, yeah, I thought I'd lost you guys, but anyhow. Okay, so Karim's just a town. Okay, so... Um, so the guy, you're coming in from the north and you report at Academy. What do you say? Okay, so let's say, for example, um, you as an aircraft, you say, Marabin Tower, Alpha Bravo Charlie, 1,500 at, at Academy. And let's say, for example, the runway is 17, I don't know, left. They're using 17 left and right. The tower would say, Alpha Bravo Charlie, join final, runway 17 left, report final. Okay, so that thinks, well, Join final, report final. What does that mean? Now, final can extend, you know, five, six, seven miles. And we saw here from the chart that this basically, if you're at Academy, you'll see this control zone, three miles. So if you're coming from the north and you report at Academy, you can take now, you turn, do a right-hand turn, and basically it's... Report final is normally uh, at four miles before from the touchdown zone. So you can, you can once you've done your left turn, or sorry, your right turn, and you turn onto final, that's when you report final. And normally that'll happen at three miles or four miles. So once you're established on final, and you can see the runway right in front here, you report final. And then the reason they say report final is because then they can say, well, you clear the land or you know, continue, whatever they need to tell you to keep you separated. Uh, like I said, uh, as long as they've got the right se runway separation, they can say, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie, runway 17 left, clear to land, uh, Cessna 152, uh, at, on the uh, traffic is 172, taxiing off the runway for... Um, for whatever, or whatever reason, uh, a caution taxi, uh, Cessna 152 uh, on the runway. So it's it can be a little bit sort of difficult to comprehend, but that's basically what they 
that's that's the sort of call that you can expect of, to hear from Moorabbin Tower. He'll tell you that he's once he's made contact with you, he you know that that's a clearance to enter the control zone, and that's basically all you need to understand is that as soon as you make contact with him and he tells you to you know, join final or join downwind, uh, maintain 1,500, that is a clearance to enter the control zone, OK? So that's something... Um, now, also, um, the air traffic control will sometimes tell you, he'll give you some what they call sequencing. Uh, and let's say for, the, for in this particular example, uh, you've been told to follow somebody on downwind, he'll say, Alpha, jo Alpha Bravo Charlie, follow the Cessna on late downwind. So let's say, for example, you're coming from the, the south and you're, the circuit is runway 35 and it's right-hand circuits. Um, he'll say, you know, join downwind runway 35, uh, follow the Cessna on late downwind. So that's something that you sort of... That's another way of... Um, or what air traffic control will do. They will sequence the aircraft. Um, OK, so um, what else is there? Uh, OK, so just bear with me for a minute. Now, as we saw, let's say... You're an, you're an aircraft coming from the east and you report at GMH. And as I said before, a circuit joining instruction from a tower is a clearance basically to enter the control zone. So um, a tower may give you, uh, or might say to you something like, Alpha Bravo Ch Charlie, join base runway 35 right, which is... That's 35 right. So he'll say there's bases there. So he'll say base and uh, report report at Parkmore because that allows him extra time to be able to see that he can ask you to join base. So you basically but report at Parkmore. So you've actually got a truck track to Parkmore. And once you've reached Parkmore, uh, you say, Moorabbin Tower, Alpha Bravo Charlie, 1,500, Parkmore. And then he'll say, Alpha Bravo Charlie, join base, runway 35 right. Or he'll say, Alpha Bravo Charlie, clear the visual approach, runway 35 right, you're number two to the Cessna on final. Or words to that effect. So he's sequencing you. Excuse me, my chai is getting a bit cold. but So that's something... The phraseology that you can expect from a Rabin Tower. And once again, it's all about sequencing and telling you about traffic. Okay? Um, so that's really, um, I'm not, hopefully, um, I've sort of given you a, uh, an understanding, a broad understanding of what the class um, Delta airspace is all about, or shall I say the metro, metro class Delta, or commonly, well, used to be called GAPS. So now procedural towers is probably another subject. It, and I'll be, like I said, quite honest, I'm not really 100% sure on the phraseology and what you, what you need to do as a Albury Tower or Alice Springs Tower. And that's probably something that I'll go, I'll investigate or further investigation. Um, also, suffice to say, uh, well, I don't think I've seen what I've seen in in. Um, there's this airfield here, which is good old Essendon, and that's probably a subject of another sort of stream talking about how to deal with flights. In Essendon, and I, actually the TMA is quite good with dealing with that, but uh, I may go over some specific nuances with Essendon, and uh, that'll be a subject for another another day. So I ho hopefully I've said shed said I'll say that. Hi Luke, how you going? Uh, is that oh okay? That's uh, your 
your home airport. Well, hopefully, uh, Jack, the um, this uh, stream will give you an insight on a where to look for the information. Uh, like I said, the first thing is you've got to absorb everything that's in that FAC document, uh, like I showed you before, which is this one here. So try to try to absorb that, and uh, and whether you are a pilot or an, or a, a controller, um, because. I found in my experiences, the more I make it realistic, the it's a challenge, don't get me wrong, but it's it's a lot more enjoyable uh, because who in the hell wants to just fly from, let's say, from Moorabbin to up to Melbourne and do it in a straight line? I personally, I'd, I'd do it the, like the real world. So, um, yeah, I'm good, Luke. Yeah, I'm just drinking my cold chai tea at the moment. It's not that... It's better when it's hot. But the good news is that, um, and as you guys know, I'm, I still haven't, uh, <laughs> I haven't uh, loaded up my Microsoft Flight Simulator. But I'm hearing good things. Uh, they're starting to fix up all the crash, to crash to deck to desktops that they've been having with the MS Twenty Twenty. Um, so hopefully that'll be happening in the next month or so with me. And uh, I think that probably the next thing is actually me flying and me flying by the real world um, procedures. In other words, if someone's good enough, I don't know if, uh, if uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, who's on? Rabin Tower, who's on there? Trying to, uh, yeah, Daniel, Daniel Schmidt. Oh, by the way, this is... Also, as I said before, guys, always get this VAT spy so you know who's on and who's where they're controlling. And you can see, you know, Melbourne Approach, Daniel Smythe, he's doing approach. So let's say, for example, you know, that's what Sim's all about, is just trying to emulate real-world procedures. And so if I want to go Moorabbin now, talking about real world, if I'm a Cessna 172, I want to fly to Melbourne, do you think that's realistic? Oh, well done, Jack. Congratulations. Yeah, well, I hope so, mate. Um, now, I'm not sure, Jack, is... I'm sure I've seen something about there in the Moodle, I think they call it, still call it Moodle, is it? That there is a procedural course that you can do. But if you get your S3, you can do procedural. I think that's the way it works. But if you're an S2, you can't do procedural. I'm not sure if that's that's the way. So yeah, now if I'm if I'm a Cessna one, and I've seen people all the time, they get the they come online, and this kid wants to go from Moorabbin to Melbourne, and that's good, that's fine, that's him. You can do anything you want, but in the real world, well, it's not really practical, and I'll tell you why. A because Melbourne is an RPT. Airport. In other words, they just they want to shift people from, you know, they just it's just a people carrier. They just it's not it's not a training base. So and not only that, but if you're operating with Cessna 172, you know what the landing fees are at Melbourne? Horrendous. Well, if you want to do a touch and go at Melbourne, you know, every time I don't know what the fees are unless your name is Stephen Jury. I think that's his name. And you want to, during the lockdown, he did a flight from Moorabbin. He landed at Melbourne because there was no aircraft around. He thought it was great, but I think it cost him several thousand dollars. So if that's your thing, well, great. So he, that's the reason he just wanted the thrill of landing at Melbourne Airport because in the real world, he couldn't, he, during the normal operations, he can't do that. Oh, hang on, I'll say that again. He probably can, but it's not cheap. Um, so that's another thing. But having said that, what you can do is you can fly, let's say from Moorabbin up to some, I don't know, Ballarat. And you can now, there is a way you can fly south and you can go this way down here and stay. But you, there's nothing stopping you going Melbourne, Moorabbin, Moorabbin, Melbourne to Ballarat. You can overfly it, but you're going to be, at, you've got to be above the six, or you've got to be above 5,000 feet. Uh, which is the auto release height? You've got to be you've got to be transiting this airspace, 
and you, can, you have to talk to ACC. If you're happy to do that, uh, you're going through at 6,000 feet and then you go to Ballarat. If you don't want to fly VFR and go, there's nothing wrong with going straight through Melbourne and having to talk to, A, got to get a clearance, and B, you talk to the controllers at Melbourne and then flying out to Ballarat. I mean, you know. Um, so that's, that's a lot more, that's, that's something that's a lot more practical rather than just going from Moorabbin to Melbourne. Um, and, this, and this also, uh, a lot of times you see a lot of flights going from Melbourne and they practice their approaches at Avalon, which is a very, very practical. So that's something that probably, yeah, Moodle, yeah, it's called Moodle. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, of course, you need the extra training. Um, but really, it's just a matter of, if you remember, it's because everything is based on site, okay, um, that, where is it? Okay. So based on site, uh, so if, you're, if you want to operate, you're going to be based on site. Now, obviously, we're not in the tower, so this is what we use. So, yep, okay, I've identified you at Cerebrus or I've identified you at GMH because this is only two miles. And that's why these guys, they get the binoculars out and they, you know, identify you at GMH or wherever. So then you, you, can, you can give them instructions from there. So as long as you, okay, you can see that aircraft, you identify him and then you tell him to report wherever, like from GMH he reports at some point, what was it again? Tell him to report at Parkmore. Now, having said that, MSFS, does that allow you to track to Parkmore? So, yeah, you, as long as you understand all these visual reporting points, that's the first thing as a controller, and just basically understanding sequencing of aircraft So, and where to report. Um, and as the FAC said, it, it, they have to report downwind. It's obligatory to report downwind when they're doing circuit training, but also um, you can tell them to report downwind if they're coming into your control zone as well. And there's all sorts of phraseology. And also, the biggest thing, of course, is giving traffic information. And that's something that's really a lot of people can't get their head around. Um, and just having an ability to sequence that aircraft. So if you've got this guy at Brighton, you've got another guy at Academy, well, you've actually got to make a decision. You've got to say, okay, this guy is the Cessna 172 and this guy is a Beechcraft Baron or whatever. Um, I'll get this guy first to get this guy second, but you've got to tell this guy about this guy and vice versa. So knowing how to re relay traffic information is really important. Hi, Daniel. Enjoy your time on Moorabbin Tower, mate. Yeah, so it's all about giving information, traffic information, and basically sequencing that traffic in order to get an orderly flow and say, you know, he's going to be, I'll get this guy in front of this guy and I'll get this guy behind him. And so that's what really um, Metro Class D operations are all about. Um, and if you get your head around that, you're well on your way to uh, becoming a really good Class D operator. Um, at a, probably another another time, I'll do CTAFs and when CTAFs really CTAFs are really easy. I mean, like I said, it's the idea of CTAFs is to make them short, sharp, and succinct transmissions. In other words, don't go into all the garbage. But um, yeah, please remember, if you're, there is no, like Daniel was on, yeah, yeah, it is good fun. Um, yeah, so is VFR flying now, so especially with MSF 2020, it's it's really good fun. Um, now, how do I know that? I haven't got it, but I watch heaps and heaps of videos. So, yeah, I can see that. And they're not only that, they, there are some, I think there's software available, let's say, for example, um, we can download the 3D image or something into MSFS and and put the. I know there's a 
there's a VFR reporting point in Jandicott. It's called a powerhouse, which is it's exactly that. It's a powerhouse that hasn't been used for 30 years. It's an old derelict building, but they use that for inbound calls coming into Jandicott Airport. They report at the powerhouse, or sorry, they make the call at the powerhouse, and then as they come in towards Jandicott, uh, they report at what they call um, Adventure World, which is a, a fun park, you know, with slides and all that. So they report there, and then air traffic control says, uh, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie, clear the visual approach, runway, I don't know, what's Jandicott, no, I can't remember now, 118, 17. Uh, yeah, clear the visual approach, runway, oh, sorry. They say, uh, Alpha Bravo Charlie, uh, enter, late, enter downwind runway 17, um, 1,500 or 1,000. Uh, so, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know what I was going to say then. Uh, so it's just getting your head around the, what your actual responsibilities are as an air traffic controller or what what your responsibilities are as a pilot, really, and just read the relevant document documentation because it's all out there. Um, it just can. Uh, and oh, like, I, oh, that's right, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, because I'm going to be downloading it because once this sim update is all, I think in late September they're doing the next update to MS, and then I'm just going to install it, and uh, and we'll go from there, and we'll actually. I'll do some flights and as per real world, and I'll flight plan as per real world. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, let's, let's be realistic. <laughs> if you're in Melbourne Tower, what are you actually saying? Clear to land, clear for takeoff, uh, velocity 235, line up, uh, velocity 235, uh, company 737 on three mile five behind that aircraft, line up behind. Um, basically, what, what else is there, really? You know? So that's pretty boring, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, this is Class D is, is far more exciting and challenging, and um. Actually, my uh, my groomsman, actually one of my groom, or my best mate, we were best mates in the air force. Um, he's in air traffic. He's still in air traffic. Um, he's an hour at the moment, but he actually did a stint at Jandicott, and uh, he reckons it was really mad. It was bloody chaotic. He reckoned these guys are crazy because he had shit aircraft going everywhere and doing everything. Because it, class D in the real world, it, it's. I mean, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I think Jandicott or Moorabbin, one of them is got an extremely high volume of traffic. Um, so it can be pretty hairy. And I remember my mate saying, you know, on some days he's just tearing his hair out because you just got, you're looking everywhere because you, your responsibility is to sequence these aircraft. So you can imagine, uh, and it wouldn't be uncommon, you get about eight or nine aircraft in the, in the in the control zone, and you as an air traffic controller have to make each person aware of each other, and then and then sequence them. You know, now they they they're responsible for their own separation. Which heaven, thank Christ for that. You know, but but you as a as a controller up in that tower. You actually have to sequence them all. You know, it's like a, it's like a centre control or an approach control. It has to be able to sequence the aircraft onto final. And normally, you like to keep about six miles. So it's the same sort of thing, except with the approach control. Of course, you actually got to separate them as well. And that's why you use that. There's that three mile sort of um, separation standard or radar separation standard. But uh, so, you know, you, you don't have to separate the aircraft, but you've got to give them traffic information and you have to actually sequence them. So, um, so yeah, it can be pretty hairy. So, yeah, I think, I think um, that would probably wrap it up. Is there, if there are any questions um, that hopefully I can fill the gaps? Any questions out there that you may want to 
um, asked me about. Um, see, like I said, have a look at this. It's really, you need to... You really The things you really need to know are GMH, is the, the GMH building, Academy. So let's say, for example, an aircraft says, uh, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie, GMH, 1,500. You know, OK, I'll look out this way. Or Academy, I'll look up in the northeast. Or Brighton, because that's basically what I know, and Carrum. So these are really what the, the main ones to, to know about. Now, these other ones, these are all VFR points, and you know this one here is the VFR route. So if some guy um, departs, um, you've got to know all these departure uh, or all these, uh, what's the right word, tracking points. So some are tracking points and some are actually, see that one there is Melbourne City. And the reason these are there really is not really for Moorabbin, it's more or less, these are more or less to do with, I'm not sure why these have been included, because this is more for the approach controller, Melbourne approach. Because it's not uncommon for this, you know, take off Moorabbin, you do a bit of a, you know, you see, you hear aircraft wanting to do orbits around the Melbourne city. So this is the approach controller, he wants to do two orbits. You see Stephen Jury all the time, you know, or can I... Yeah, you know, two orbits and the guy will say, yeah, you report when, when finished or whatever. And there's the MCG. So these are all navigational and there's the Westgate Bridge, that one there. Um, uh, Altona South. I think that's Altona South. So, yeah, so it's good to, to be familiar with this, but really these are the ones here that you really need to, to be familiar with. And actually, I'm, oh, here it is. Here's that VFR route. That Remember this chart that I showed you up here? This is the recommended VFR route. Well, that's it there. Have a look. See? And they say they... Okay, so... So if you're, if you're a VFR pilot and you want to do a flight from, from the north and you want to come into... You want to come into Moorabbin, and I've seen it heaps of times... <laughs> They want to go straight through bloody Melbourne. They want to go straight through here. And then they come in through here. And they're a VFR aircraft. And I'm thinking, well, you know, you you having a laugh or what? But they're not a, they're not familiar. Get become familiar with this, guys, you people out there. Understand understand your altitudes. And do a do a flight if you guys got MS. Yeah, that's exactly right. But they don't. You don't give them a departure heading. The, the approach will do that. You all you need to do is just to. You just tell them to clear. Make a, sorry. As soon as he passes two thousand, you tell this guy um, Alpha Bravo Charlie, passing two thousand five hundred contact approach on one three two decimal zero, and then as soon as he ta contacts approach, approach will look after him. And he'll vector him or do whatever. So that's basically what you need to do, Jack. Uh, yeah. But you're not really... Oh, probably that's the other thing. Yeah, Mer Melbourne Tower does the coordination with approach. But you, as Moorabbin Tower, don't do any coordination. You just basically uh, tell the guy to contact approach on passing 2,500. Uh, and the reason that is because... He's got the clearance, he'll get a clearance, but then of course he gets he needs to be identified and he needs to and then he's under approaches control. Well that's right, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a fair comment. Yeah, exactly right. So if you're going into class G, you don't need to really worry about it. Because if you can imagine, there's Morabin. Um, actually, I'll get this is a better show there. So if you if you take off and you're one thousand five hundred, see how this control, see how C low lower level. So if you're going departing to the south, straight away you go straight into Class G. But if you're departing up here, you see the lowest level, and you're climbing, climbing, climbing. You're going to paint. You're going to hit that control zone, or sorry, that Class Charlie 
airspace. So you need to you, you need to uh, contact approach. So that's the other thing. Know your know your airspace. I I can't. So okay. So any other questions? Um, hopefully I made it a bit clearer. But I think really, once I if I ever if I do a flight, like I said, I'll do a flight and I'll go from here. I'll go out to Latrobe Valley when in the east, in the east, yeah, and I'll do another one and I'll go out to, I don't know what's out to the west, Ballarat, I guess, yeah. If I go Ballarat, and I'll do a flight and I'll go via and I'll try to, you know, if, oh, there's another thing. If I want to go from Rabin, I'm not sure if you can do this. Like I said before, little nav map is magic. And uh, little nav map, I guarantee, has got all these VFR reporting points. I'm sure of it. Um, and if they haven't, I'm sure there's a way of getting them. But uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. And then you bring it into your, um, into your GPS. However... Don't use your GPS. Use it only as a guide. Fly, see if you, when you leave Moorabbin and fly along the coast and see if you can see the Brighton jetty and then, you know, oh, by the way, if you're flying along there, see this danger area, surface 2,500, yeah, because you've got parachute drops. So that will be no tammed as well. So in the real world, you call Melbourne Approach and you ask them uh, whether this is active or not because this becomes active at certain times because you've got this parachuting drops happening. So you just can't fly through there if this is active. So, yeah, and then see if you, you can see that, well, station pier is that. It's just basically all these piers, and you can fly along this, this coastline here and then go past the Laverton uh, Bureau of Meteorology Tower, and I think they're two white balls, I think. Uh, and then from there you go up to... Ballarat, and then you see under here, if you're 1,500, you stay underneath the, the Class Charlie step. So I think, um, and I think if you see it done in as per either flying or as a, a controller yourself, I think things sort of, by me going through it, uh, let me read. So, I mean, for Melbourne, the SAA is roughly 2,000 due to the fact that you want to maintain separation from inbound traffic and pass that line in Class Charlie, whereas below you're in Class G. I'm not sure, Daniel, what you're trying to say there, but, um, yeah. So... It's, it's difficult um, to try to put all this into your head, uh, but it's like anything else. If you keep on doing it enough times, it'll become second nature. So, And that's what the beauty of simming is all about, you know. Expect to stuff up. Expect to... It's like flying you know, in the sim, you know. I remember when I first started, holy crap, I didn't... Now, this is interesting too. Also, read this. Recommended procedures. Tracking from PTOM, which is the uh Okay, so if you're flying eastbound along this VFR uh, tracking route, flying eastbound you fly at 1500, but if you fly westbound you fly at 2000. Okay? So that's it. Track to the right of lane if oncoming aircraft is identified. So, you know, you track, stay to the right-hand side and you've got that 500 separation. Okay, we're practical. Track the way of the coast. Landing attack the lights on. Avoid overflowing oil refineries and tanks. Okay. So, yeah. So I hope... Oh, Okay. Yeah, Leverton. I, I've been to actually, this is because I, I did my air traffic, well, I did my basic training at Pierce, uh, 
Pierce, Point Cook back in the day. And I remember running up oh, this, yeah, we, we went to Laverton. I can't remember why we went to Laverton. That's the AFB Air Force Base. And now it's, I don't think it's, it's been disbanded now, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and uh, good old Werribee. So um, that brings back a few memories, yeah. There's a pizza place. Because you had to stay on the base for four weeks and then after that, and the first thing we did, a whole group of us, we 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 went out to Werribee and there's a pizza hut or something. I think I I, I never had so much pizza in all my life because we were four weeks on base and we um, we just got fed bloody all the healthy stuff. But uh, yeah, we we're all hanging out for burgers and pizzas back in the day. Yeah, we went out to Werribee to consume copious amounts of pizza and beer and anyhow but that was another time okay yeah VTC okay so let's say we go to a place called aeronautical information packages which is if you have a look at that up there Air Service Australia dot com forward slash ARP forward slash ARP dot ASP. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff there. You press I agree and you see here AIP charts. You see that? And there they are, VTC. And look at all the VTCs. Now, like I said, there's the procedures. Caratha is one. Hobart is one. Uh... Aubrey is is one. Alice Springs is a, is one. They're all procedural. Okay. Now, so I went to Melbourne, downloaded it, and you can see, and that's basically, and I just downloaded it in a PDF format. So that's where you get the chart, Daniel. And uh, I think it's, it's only came into. I think the last year, year and a half or so, you've been able to get these. Before you didn't, you had to pay for them. And I know in England, you, you can't get them. Uh, in England, you still have to pay for them. If you go to some, the AIP in England, uh, or whoever the controlling body is uh, in England, you, still, you can't get them. Now, back in the day, when I used to fly P3D, I used to fly in America. Oh, now, here's something I've got to tell you. Back in the day, when I had P3D and you couldn't identify um, your visual reporting points, the VFR reporting points, let's say, and I, I, let's say I left Latrobe Valley and I wanted to go to Moorabbin, I put, used to put this, you used to be able to, P3D, I think you save plan, or no, you ex export your plan into FPL, you download that, and you used to be able to bring that FPL into your um, into your um, into your Garmin back in the day, and so you had this lovely thing. And see how he GMH, you actually can can put all these points. So as I I pretended that I could see this GMH, in, even though you couldn't, you know, but I pretended, you know, and I'd make the calls to now. I'd make the calls. But that's basically Sky Vector, even though these VFR charts aren't VFR charts, they're actually crap, but you can still put in the VFR reporting points. So let's say, for example, like, so we'll go to, see, Academy is A-C-E. See how the underscore A-C-E? Have a look at this. So we'll get rid of that. Delete. And we go... A, C, E, and look at that. And that's exactly where Academy is. It's there. It's six miles away from Moorabbin. And then you, I used to be able to, yeah, like I said, I used to be able to export it, blah, 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 and away I go. So that's something. If you're flying a P3D, I knew you could do it with P3D. I'm not sure if you can do it with X-Plane uh, because this is in a... But I'm sure if you can, like I said... Little nav map, fantastic for VFR flight planning. So um, that's something that's 
that you, you VFR flight plan. IFR, nah, don't use it. And I know. It's <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, you got the big VNC, okay. Now, obviously, uh, if you want to do large sorties, there's called WAC, which are the World Aeronauticals. Well, um, they don't have that, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, but if you're flying short distances, yeah, by all means, you can, you can use this. So... Um, well, how long have I been going? Uh, one hour, just over an hour and a half. You can't, okay. You can't do it in X-Plane, all right. But can you bring your little nav map plans into X-Plane, Jack? Avatab, okay. Um, but that's paid subscription. Is Avatab paid or...? I think that's paid, isn't it? And me, because I'm a tight, tight ass. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, right, okay. I'm not familiar with Avatab, so. Okay, so that's basically, and it just basically gives you all these things on charts and stuff. Okay, well, that's fine, yep. So th is this more geared for IFR then, is it? because it looks like it's all geared for IFR stuff. Okay, so that's a VFR. That's a v it looks like a VFR. And, well, maybe not. It was just showing airspace around wherever that is. EDHL, uh, yeah, wherever. Okay. Yeah, okay. So now, like I said, I used to do a lot of, lot of flying in America. And you probably know what I'm going to say, but anyhow. And I used to love it because there it is. These are your VFR maps. So I used to love, I, if you ever get a chance, fly VFR in America. It's magic. It's absolutely magic. Now, the thing is, of course, you've got to understand, and because I haven't flown it over in a year and a half or whatever, these are different airspaces, and um, now I'm, I'm guessing now. I think that's a class D airspace. They've got class Alpha, like us, and then they've got class Bravo, which we don't have. But class Bravo is basically a cla our class Charlie, and the way you remember class Bravo is it, it means B for big. In other words, if you go to a big capital city. I don't know. There, Seattle. Have a look at that. That's all class Bravo airspace, and it's bloody complicated. So it's equivalent to our class Charlie. So you have a look at that. So, and these you think, oh shit, you know, six thousand to seven thousand there, and five thousand ten, but that's basically catering for the the for aircraft. See how you've got the runways there at Seattle is basically north south orientation. So that's basically catering for aircraft arriving from into these uh, north-south orientated runways. Okay, so now I'm starting to get off the track now. It's not really based toward IFR or CDR, but it has a map that shows landmarks. Oh, okay, right. Okay, IFR or VFR. Okay, oh, well, that's handy, that's good. So there are ways to do it, but... Um, yeah, so anyhow, um, I think that'll be my next challenge, really, uh, within a month or so. Like I said, I'll probably do other things. Um, I'll actually do a tutorial on CTAFs because at the end of the day, more often than not, Moorabbin is, is not towered, especially in the VATSIM environment, unless you've got Jack, uh, Daniel going around the place. Um, yeah, so... And uh, roughly, we don't really have any fly-ins. We should have a, a VFR fly-in, you know, like have... I know we have Milk Run Mondays, and I'm going to get Milk Run Wednesdays going too, by the way, you guys, where it's from Melbourne to Adelaide, to Adelaide to Melbourne. I reckon I had a few people really interested in that. I'm not sure why they call it Milk Run, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, 
Uh, yeah, so I'll be controlling on Wednesdays, hopefully. Um, I've worked out how to put schedules out on this uh, bloody live stream, on this OBS Streamlabs or whatever it's called. So, um, yeah. So I think we'll wrap it up. Any more questions? Um, whether it's to do with the VFR maps or... Um, yeah, I think I'll go into VFR flight planning when I actually download the uh, FS2020 and actually do a flight and I'll explain all my... why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, but basically, VFR flight planning, A, is make sure you're... You're missing obstacles, whether it's it could be a, a radio mast, could be a site of a mountain, um, and uh, and basically making sure you're in VMC conditions. Because if VMC conditions don't exist, well, forget about flying VFR, which a lot of people, you know, if I can't, if I decide to go from Rabin to Ballarat, and let's say Ballarat is what we cl called closed in. In other words, there's no VMC conditions. Well, I can't fly v I can't fly VFR, can I? So it's it's a lot. It's a planning in advance. Uh, whereas IFR, I don't care. Uh, you know, I can fly from point A to point B, and I don't give a rat's ass about. Oh, excuse the French, sorry. I don't care about um, the conditions at Ballarat because I'm IFR. So there will be all sorts of procedures or all sorts of approaches I can do. But if I'm flying to Ballarat, I've got to make sure that the conditions of Ballarat are good or conducive to VFR flying. Now, this is something that I found. I think YBLT is Ballarat, isn't it? YBLT. Let's see if we can find the... No, it doesn't tell us. This is handy, but more often than... well. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but having said that, you can you can actually phone. You make a phone call to the, you know, listen to the Ballarat A Was or whatever it's called. So and that's what, you know, what's his name? That's what he does. If you watch his videos, Adelaide to Melbourne is my favourite route. So expect me there next Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jack. No worries. Okay, any more questions? Hopefully, um, anything that I've said here, I'll try to, like I put it in a practical sort of way. Um, and I think the best way is to do it via the actual, actually flying a particular VFR route and going through all the radio calls. Um, because I'll, what I'll do is, well, I plan to say, well, okay, Moravon Tower's not online, or I might get Daniel to, I don't know, you can you can man Morabin and we'll go through the procedures. If you want to if you want to do that, uh, Daniel, tee up a time or whatever. Um, yeah, and we'll go through the procedure. And if Morabin Tower is going to be offline, well, I'll just go through the CTAF. And so, hopefully, we can take it from there. All right, guys. Well, I think that's it. My wife's just telling me the it's raining over in Perth. Okay, fair enough. And uh, it's quarter to five over here. I might start the fire. Might have another chai, and uh, I think there's no more questions. With that, I'll wrap it up, and uh, hopefully I'll see you all maybe on Wednesday. Well, definitely, I guess, if, if nothing else happens. I'll see you on Wednesdays, and 